Welcome to this uh, second session and last session of, of today's um, debate. Uh, the topic uh, this afternoon is on open science uh, for an open world. Uh, this concept is an evolving concept. It's a very broad concept which has a different meaning depending on who you're um, talking to. There's um, some people believe uh, that it's about um, making uh, science uh, broader, uh, not just restricting to science that's applied, um, encompassing even more uh, blue sky research. Uh, there's also um, definition of open science which relates to the scientific process, uh, the nature of the scientific process and how it's currently hindered by some bottleneck along the way, and that's one of the of the interpretation of open science that we want to discuss. And then open science is also opening science beyond the scientific community so that people who have a stake in how science is being done uh, should have a say on its uh, processes. So that's why we had the first session on uh, participative science whereby citizens and other people with uh, some relevant um, involvement should have a say in the process of science. So we have um, a, a distinguished panel here today and I will let them introduce themselves directly. We will also have uh, three external um, people who, are, who will be uh, commenting, fr two from the US and one from uh, Spain. Uh, so first of all, I will open the floor to um, Sarah um, Ricardo who will uh, tell you all about her vision of open science. Hello, everyone. So I am here as a representation of the Marie Curie Alumni Association. And so one thing that uh, we are, I'll explain a bit the, about the association. So uh, the association is an European association that is composed of um, fellows or former fellows, alumni, that had a Marie Curie grant or Marie Curie fellowship. Uh, this has an advantage and, and also for, the con for this uh, question of open science has, um, gives us an opportunity. Why? Because the Marie Curie Alumni Association, in fact, with having so many fellows across uh, all sectors and all fields, gives us an opportunity to have a view of, on the side of the researcher that we can um, that can inform us on the decisions that then we can talk to other stakeholders. And so this is um, something that we are really interested in. And uh, in that sense, uh, we can see that depending where you are, which field you are, or what sector you, you are, uh, open science has different challenges and, and different uh, concepts. And so, uh, as Sabine um, has commented, open science uh, has been a movement that has started um, let's say not extremely recently, but recently enough, and it, it's becoming um, something that we it will it will occur, uh, but it's still very very confusing in many people's minds. And I think um, there are many many advantages into moving to a system that is fairer and more transparent and and can be reusable and and can be refutable, which is the case of moving into open science. But we do have many challenges. And as I said, this is um, something that involves a lot of different stakeholders, not just the researchers, but involves funding agencies, governments, universities, and everybody needs to be on board into, uh, um, to the same aim. So from my experience in talking to people, I, I have not introduced myself, I will do now. So I am representing the Marie Curie Alumni Association because I am I'm part of the board of the chapter of Spain and Portugal. And I'm also in the working group of the science policy. And in that sense, uh, from uh, talking to fellows, there's, as I said, very different uh, concerns depending on which uh, sector you are or which field you are. So we have, though, uh, common um, challenges and concerns from fellows. And one of them, and we did um, talk a bit about it in the first session in the morning, which is the issue of uh, data protection. So open science is all about sharing, right? People like the idea of sharing, but people are afraid of sharing. And this is a very, very common concern from uh, the researchers, at least within our fellow network. And this is something that we need to address, because I think if we are going to make open science a reality, 
we need to make uh, the scientists not be afraid to share their data and to share their research. And right now they do. They are afraid of their work are, is going to be stolen, who's going to have copyright of their work, who, first, first of all, this is one question that we get, uh, who even has the copyright? I mean, people do the work and they don't even know who owns the copyright of their own work. And so these questions need to be to be addressed and another common issue is people are it, it differs a lot between fields it's it's very interesting because as our fellows are from all different fields uh, we talk to physicists or to mathematicians and they have absolutely no issue with sharing their data and we doing collaborative work on say shared platforms with everything open but then we talk to life scientists and they have they do have an issue and they are not as uh, straightforward in using it. And, and then we talk to social scientists and they have really big issues with copyright issues and they would like to do those issues to be addressed. And so just we'd like to put the other slide up. Uh, it's the next one. I don't know if it's the right presentation. No, it doesn't matter. It's, it's not up, but I will, no. It's okay, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. I will explain. So the, there's two actions that we are taking now um, from, the, from the Science Policy Working Group. Uh, one is uh, we're going to have a webinar in September where that is actually organized in, uh, together with our scientists. Um, and so this is the first step to cl uh, basically clarify. I think we need still to do a lot of work into clarifying in people's minds what things are and what they mean and what can be the advantages for scientists in, in, in doing uh, sharing of, of their data and sharing of their science. Um, so we're going to have a webinar in September that is organized together with, with our scientists about the issue. And we are also uh, uh, in the first stages of preparing a proposal for ESOF in Toulouse in next year. And so this is something that we, uh, we would like very much to um, talk to people because we would like this to be a collaborative effort and to have partners on this proposal. So we now have two confirmed partners, Eurodoc and Open Scholar, and we would like to have more partners on board. And either depending on the time that we have to prepare and also on the partners involved, we would either do a more um, just uh, awareness uh, of open science or we can directly talk, tackle some specific questions and, some, and do some specific actions uh, related to questions of open science. So these are the plans for the future from within the association. And if anybody is interested in joining us for the ESOF uh, proposal, uh, we are uh, all welcome to everybody wanting to collaborate with us. We are welcome to any collaboration. So just come talk to us. I had a slide with our contact details, but I will uh, be happy to share any contact details with you if you want. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, extensive uh, perspective on how you and your members are um, dealing with open science. So we will uh, swiftly move on to uh, Slobodan uh, Radishev, who will um, introduce himself again and his perspective on open science. Uh, hello, my, my name is Slobodan Radishev. Originally, I'm, I'm from Serbia, but at the moment, I'm, I, I'm living in Italy. Uh, so. I'm also at, at, at this moment I'm governing board member of, of Euroscience and as you can see in the program uh, also there is like OAA which means Open Access Academy and I'm one of the founder of, of this project. Let's say this is still not organization, it is, it is, it is just project. So just to share a very sh short story how I get involved uh, in, in open science or actually uh, it, it, it was more about the open access. Just like four years ago, um, neither me, neither my colleagues, young researcher, PhD candidates, didn't know much about the open access. You know, just some time to time you hear something, but you know, always when it, when it comes to the publication, you just publishing where your supervisor or your chief decide that you will publish. So you couldn't have uh, the, the chance. So. All this story, it, it, it came like in, in past year or two. 
So basically, at, at that time, I was the chair of Eurodoc, European Council of Doctoral Candidates and Junior Researchers that we mentioned here a couple of times, and we got invitation from Right Research Coalition from the United States for some meeting, and another board member couldn't go there, and I, I didn't know, to be honest, I, I didn't know almost anything about uh, open access, uh, couldn't go there, so I went instead of this another board member, and then that is how I get in touch with, with, uh, with open access and, and open science. And from the first moment, I, I recognized that as a really important thing. And I, I, I invest quite a lot of time you know, to spread the idea about open access and open science among young candidates, and not only am, uh, uh, among uh, young uh, uh, junior researchers, but also among the students, like master students, because many of them will also uh, continue w their career at, uh, as, as researchers. And uh, not, on, not only that, but uh, for, for those who, who will not continue career, to be user of, of, uh, of like fruits of open, open science. And when we are speaking about open science, you know, my, my colleague Sarah, she already mentioned like uh, all issues that uh, young researchers facing with. So, I, I don't have almost anything, anything to, to, to add to that. What I would, would like to add is that we as scientists, especially young scientists, we have th probably the biggest responsibility to change the system because the most of those who are now senior and old doesn't want to change that since that system actually lets them to be there. So we need to be aware of that situation. Okay, and, and would you um, share your first-hand experience with the Open Access Academy as well? Yeah, uh, the Open Access Academy project, uh, I th you, you can just type Open Access Academy at, at, at the Google and it, it, it will appear. Um, I start that project uh, after with, with the support of uh, Right Research Coalition and Spark from the United States with one colleague from uh, Max Planck Institute. He was at, at that moment uh, leader of, of, of their group of young scientists. Uh, basically, what we are doing, you know, this project is going up and down, depend, you know, how much free time we have since, you know, we are all volunteers that that working on that. And uh, we are using just to, to to try to reach as much as possible uh, young people from all around the world and to inform them, you know, about open access, about open data, open education resources, to inform them about the events, about the possibilities, about the way how they can publish, and, and, and many other things that are connected, let's say in general, about open science. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to our third panelist, uh, Luc uh, van Dijk, please. Uh, so my name is Luc van Dijk. Um, I'm a molecular bio biologist by training, uh, and I've been working in science policy since quite a while now, uh, and I'm a freelance consultant. Don't really know why I'm here, but she really wanted me to be here. So <laughs> I will tell you, uh, I will try to answer the, the questions that were put to us. Uh, what is my perspective on open science in an open world? So I think that the first, the first issue is really to see what is the problem that needs to be solved. Um, many references have been made uh, at the uh, German example as a good example uh, of the science system. Um, I think that, of course, the fact that Merkel herself is a, is a physicist, that her husband um, is a professor of chemistry helps a lot, um, but uh, and also that the economic situation of the of the country is really good, so they can dare to invest money. Uh, but it's not only that. I think that until the, the, the Second World War, the Germany was really the house of science. Uh, the Nazis burned down the, the house, uh, but the tradition is still there. Um, and I think that uh, the uh, both the politicians and the, the public understands that an export country, and Germany is an export economy, needs to rely on quality technology products. And, and there is this general agreement also within the, the citizens, among the citizens, that they need to foster science and research. So I think that is one of the key... Uh, no, uh, so I think that's, that's one of the... The, 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 key, uh, the key things for Germany. So if we, if we uh, see the first question that I've summarized here, what is the problem that, we, that needs to be solved? I think that what we are looking for is a way to sustain uh, the scientific endeavor, and this can only be done with the support of the public. Um, 
So if, if, if we go back in history, after the World War, uh, the Second World War, there was a so-called social contract of science which was cast, uh, which means that public funding supports science in return for the contribution of, socio uh, the contribution of science to the socioeconomic well-being of society. Um, I think this contract is now obsolete and, and has to be revised. This is, this is a question that will um, arise in the, in the last part of the session. Um, I, 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 there are many reasons to say that this contract is obsolete. I, I would only name three. Uh, the first one is because the march uh, for science was based on, on uh, claiming evidence-based policies and, and ba policies based on facts. Uh, just to remind you uh, that uh, in 2009 there was an earthquake in Italy. Um, um, and that scientists were actually prosecuted for providing inexact, incomplete, and contradictory information. Um, uh, the, in the second process, they were released. Uh, but uh, the fact is, um, evidence-based policies, or, or the evidence provided by scientists, do not always support the policies that are needed. And um, the second example is this, this famous volcano in, in Iceland. You may remember in 2010, an explosion of the volcano, uh, ashes in the air. Um, the, the, the flights were, um, were done almost everywhere in North Europe, uh, and nothing happened. And the people were laughing. Why did we stop flying? Why, where was the danger? The scientists said there was a danger. So, the evidence-based policy is not, uh, is not a straightforward con con concept, I would say. The second one is, and this was already mentioned, I think, by Rosina earlier on, innovation is not always meeting the expectations and needs of the population. And the third one, because we are in Spain, um, especially in times of crisis, there is competition for funding. Um, and and uh, science is at the same time getting more and more expensive. So how do we justify this competition without being a corporation, a corporatist. Uh, I think that is a big danger. The discussion this morning about uh, precarity of jobs uh, in, in Portugal, for instance, you have that everywhere in society. So why the hell would, the, would society support claims from scientists while at the same time they have to endure this uh, precarity as well? It's the same uh, in, in um, in Greece, obviously. Um, I think that uh, for a long while, since the 90s, there has been a mantra, which is science communication, and scientists should get out of their lab and communicate. I'm not saying that it is wrong, um, but I think that it has largely failed, or at least it's not sufficient. Um, it's not sufficient to create a knowledge-based society and to try to get educated people. It's, we need more than that. Um, I, I think that uh, part of this came in the 90s when the GMO debate arose, uh, and, and the Commission, especially because the decisions had to be made at the level of, of, of Europe, uh, thought that if we tell the people, if we educate people, they will be more sense-friendly and they will accept things like the GMOs, and I think this was a wrong bet. Uh, so, science communication is important, but we need to have more. I skipped that one. I think we need to have a, a, a new social contract of science to better serve society, uh, a new social contract which is based on, on values and accountability, like ethics, integrity, uh, the scientific method, um, and this has to be controlled in a way. It is not controlled. Uh, although integrity make, makes the headlines uh, since years, the solution is not yet there. Uh, openness, of course, this has been discussed. <coughs> Common good versus uh, corporatism. And I think that the key element here in this new social contract uh, is the participation and the co-responsibility of society in the uh, organization of the, the scientific process and the research system. Uh, and this is valid for all kinds of research, from blue sky to uh, research de uh, and development, but also for the support of, uh, for policies. You, th those are the three main areas of where research contributes, the blue sky, uh, research and development, and support for policies. Uh, I'm surprised, I'm always surprised um, to see the debate on GMO again. Why is it, uh, why is there no funds, public funds, 
to really try to clarify these issues. Why do we have always this, uh, this fight between uh, industry-supported research with confidentiality and so on? On the other hand, those on, on, on research which are done by supporters of Greenpeace or, or others, uh, why is it not possible that we scientists as citizens demand that uh, public funding should make ex exhaustive research on the danger or not of, uh, of GMOs in various areas? Uh, and this is also for all steps of research. Uh, in, in, the, in the jargon in Brussels, they speak about co-design, co-creation, co-process, co, co a lot of co's. Uh, co-designs would be uh, uh, participation of, of, um, of citizens and stakeholders, but mostly citizens, in, in the definition of policies and programs. Co-creation is different from uh, what we have seen now, uh, citizen science. It is more like a, a research process leading to the development of new products or services, where the, uh, the citizens are um, are actually involved in the project, in, in, in making decisions there where you have to make decisions in order to make sure that what is shaped is really meeting what citizens are needing. Um, so in my, in my mind, open science means a science open to all interested parties to shape a common future. Uh, what does it require to become a reality? Uh, we need to know how this could work. Uh, we need to see what would be the objectives. How, how this could work, which methods have to be implemented. This is going to be extremely costly, but science communication is also very costly and someone has to pay the bill for that. Uh, you need to have institutional will because this should be embedded in, in funding agencies, in universities, in research centers, in foundations, and we need a lot of education and training of the scientists. Um, and, and I think that uh, the, the, the movements that have arised from, from this March for Science uh, really could play a role in that, in, in discussing with their members whether this is really this, this, this opening sense to citizens as a way to guarantee support from the public uh, in, in important decisions, especially in times of crisis, uh, um, uh, would be something that they could fight for, and this could be a common, a common agenda uh, for, for these organizations, I think. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your very extensive and uh, in-depth analysis of the current situation. I think it's, it sums up uh, the situation we're in. So we're, now we're going to move on to Martin Andler, who will uh, if, give if us we, his, his, I, his if, I, if I can make just one more comment. Uh, what I was talking about is not something completely stupid. Um, just let me take two examples. One is that in Germany, uh, the German Ministry for Science and Education is actually conducting uh, studies to see what the public would want for the research system. Uh, this is made through uh, categorizing people, surveying their needs, and then making smaller, smaller groups and, and having discussing, discussions with them. Well, this is more or less confidential, so what happens with this is unknown. Uh, but there are things which are done in this direction. Uh, it is an important step. And a, a, a last example, which is maybe even more interesting, there's a guy named Robert Madlin uh, sitting in Brussels. He's working for one of these very influential think tank. Um, uh, and um, he's not a nobody. He is the former director general of the commission DJ uh, Connect. So he's a very important guy who knows the system. Um, and, and in the course of the preparation of the uh, framework program nine, the following one, uh, Robert Madlin and his think tank have suggested that part of the, uh, of the funding, maybe between five and 10 percent, should be decided by the citizens of Europe. That means that uh, five areas would be selected presented to the people, and there would be some sort of electronic vote on which, which one of these should be supported or not. So it, it is actually being more and more concrete. It may not happen now, but it's certainly within 10 years this is going to happen. So there will be a change of paradigm in the way science is organized and, and, and the, the, the research endeavor is proceeding. Okay, all right, okay. So could switch, uh, switch chair just so that uh, Martin can have access to his presentation. 
women and bring it up. Yeah. All yours. Okay, so thank you. So I'm Martin Ander. Oops, I shouldn't touch this. I'm a mathematician, a professor of mathematics. I'm a vice president of Euroscience. When you get uh, to a certain age, you become vice president, and then you can die. Same <laughs> <laughs> uh, And even the worst things can happen. OK, so um, I, I will actually, I'm going to cheat a bit, because I'm not going to really answer the question. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll be in bad shape, I think, with my neighbor. But uh, so I'm not going to so much to talk about open science, but about science in an open society. By this, I mean that in an open society, political issues are being discussed on the pu in the public arena, and this should include science policy should be discussed in the public arena. <laughs> And uh, science-related issues, which is a different story. I mean, science policy is you know, what kind of funding, how you fund careers, stuff like that. And science-related issues is how you deal with, this, I don't know, nuclear, GMOs, and stuff like that. And all of these things also have to be discussed in the public arena. Of course, science has a kind of you know, special say in the matter, but still, they have to be discussed in the public arena. And as, uh, well, we, we all know, because this is really part of the European crisis, that uh, there is no public arena for discussing policies at the, at the European level. At national level, it exists. It doesn't exist, really, at European level. So this is, in a way, the, what I want to, to talk about. So this is a picture of Jose Mariano Gago, who was a science minister for Portugal uh, for many years. He, and, um, and the reason I, why I put this picture here is that the first person who, whom I heard saying something which was really important about science policy issues at the European level, was, is, uh, it was a lecture that he was giving in Paris, and he, somebody asked him, so why is it, why are uh, scientific programs, funding schemes at the European level, why are they so complicated, why do we feel that we don't understand how they work, they're not made for us, and, and all of these things. So, and the guy said, well, you know, so why don't you say it out loud? When the, the when any uh, policy about agriculture is decided in Brussels and people are unhappy about it, the next day the people in Brussels receive, uh, well, it was a while ago, so it received telex and faxes and maybe emails and phone calls and all of these things. And when a decision about science policy is being decided in Brussels, Nobody says anything. So, of course, the people in Brussels do whatever they like. So, if you want to, you know, to, to change things, well, you have to speak out. And Jose Mariano was, you know, very, actually played a very big role in defending science. He, he was a science minister at the time of the so-called Lisbon strategy, and uh, he also played a big role when he was not a minister, because in Portugal, it alternates between uh, the socialists and the right wing, and he was a socialist, so regularly he was in the opposition, and there he was very useful in helping various European organizations to develop. So he, he's, in a way, he's a kind of hero for me. Okay, so l let's start by uh, making an opposition between the national level and the European level. At the national level, many organizations represent scientists at the national level. And they, you know, when there is an issue, these organizations are hurt. So there are grassroots campaigns, and we've heard lots of them, but they are most, they are national organizations, academies, you know, the older guys, uh, more, you know, better scientists than me, so you are in the academy. Uh, unions of uh, employees, learned societies, there are all sorts of groups who will a lobby, uh, go to the streets in some countries where people like to go to the streets and demonstrate. There will be a public debate and when an issue is being decided about how, how 
what kind of funding, how much funding, how universities should be organized, all of these things, this comes to the public arena at the na national level. But as I said already, at the European level, it's different and it's different not only in science. So we have to find a way to make our voice heard at the European level. So what, but there are some European organizations there are university federations, like the European University Association, which regroups all like, five, six hundred universities in, in Europe. There's, uh, there's an L too much. Uh, Leru. Leru, no, so yeah, I missed the typo. Leru, League of European Research Universities, so this is a very distinguished club with only very good universities. Uh, uh, there are funding organizations like Science Europe, which, uh, which regroups uh, things like the Max Planck Gesellschaft, uh, the DFG, uh, uh, the CNR in Italy, CNRS in France, and so on. And so these are most of these organizations are governmental organizations. So in a way, Science Europe is not an independent organization. There are associations like Eurodox, Marie Curie. So. We, we heard about the Marie Curie Association, MCAA, right, now. Uh, there are European learned societies and academies like the European Physical Society, the European Math Society, European Molecular Biology Organization. A lot, well, actually, these organizations and quite a few organizations are part of a consortium which is called Initiative for Science in Europe, uh, which is trying to be the voice precisely of these kinds of organizations at the European level, and shortly Initiative for Science in Europe played a big role in, uh, j'ai presque fini? Two minutes. Two minutes, oh, that's fine, that's uh, infinite time. Uh, Initiative for Science in Europe uh, played a big role in the creation of the ERC, it lobbied very strongly for the ERC. I should mention that Luc uh, was uh, the mastermind or at least the bulldozer behind the initiative for science in Europe and actually I said that there are worse things than being vice president so I have become recently president of initiative for science in Europe uh, so that's when you get even a bit older and, and decrepit and then the last thing I will organization that I want to talk about is Euroscience Euroscience is, is uh, close to 20 years old it, it's Created, it was created precisely to represent grassroots scientists at the European level with a strong focus on science and society issues. And perhaps some of you know that the main uh, achievement of Euroscience is to organize every other year the European Euroscience Open Forum, uh, which has taken place. Well, uh, Christina told us about. Barcelona and Copenhagen and the next one is in Toulouse and the call for uh, the call is open now and closes in about two weeks so you should make uh, proposals so our issue is our goal I mean and in a way this is why we're here today is to try and see how these national grassroots organizations but which are you know, working around sort of similar similar topics and the similar ad agenda, and these uh, small, maybe not too powerful international organization, European organizations could work together. And uh, so to be sure that the voice of scientists is really heard at the European level. For instance, for FP9, which is being prepared, of course, I mean, it's not that they are doing their stuff in Brussels without any consultation with the European, uh, but it, it tends to be individuals who c go to Brussels and lobby for themselves, for, their, for themselves, or they lobby for their sub-field sub or things like that, but there's no sort of common collective uh, lobbying or collective uh, action. And just I, I don't know, but it's close to the, my last. So there are, now what are the issues? So there are traditional issues, and we should not forget the traditional issues. They're essential. Funding, how much funding we get, how is it given, because 
whether it's given on uh, competitive projects or in different ways, it has very strong consequences on the way we work. Of course, careers, and then the international issue, migrations, brain drain, uh, free circulation, all of these things. There's something about the general image of science, facts versus alternative. Maybe two years ago, we wouldn't, I would not have mentioned this, but today it seems to be a, 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 real, a real thing. There are the sort of traditional science and society problems like nuclear energy, GMO, global warming, and it has come, so this was called sort of science and society a long time, a while ago. Now we are really talking about public engagement, which means something somewhat different. I'm not going to details. And then there are all of these new ways of doing science, which is under the general banner of open science. And of course, all of these things are part of the issues that we want to raise and for which we want to argue, discuss in the public arena, and of course having our voices heard at the European level. But let's not forget that having our voices heard at the European level does not mean that we only act on the European Union. For one thing, because Europe is a bit beyond the European Union. There are countries in Europe which do not belong to the European Union. Uh, and more countries which might not belong to the European Union, and we still like the Brits enough that we think that we should talk to these guys. Uh, so it's not just the European Union, but also the fact is that 90% of the budget of science does not come from the European Union, it comes from national countries. And we should all feel concerned when uh, the situation of science becomes uh, horrible in Greece or in Portugal or in all of these countries that we've heard about uh, today. So the public arena is not just Brussels, but it's what happens everywhere in, and later we have seen, we've seen sort of lately that we, are, we should be concerned and we are concerned about things that are happening like right now in Hungary about the, the Soros uh, University. So, and then that's I think really my last slide, different modes of action. So you could march, that's this picture, you can march, demonstrate, you can uh, sort of, you know, be a sort of academy of really important people, people who feel that they're important and uh, they're, and they, um, there are geniuses and they sort of say deep things about you know, how science should be organized. And then there's sort of what happens at the political level. And here you see a picture of Gago again and somebody who was hoping six months ago to become the president of France and then things happen differently. And I think that all of these modes of action are important. We need to demonstrate. I mean, and we dif demonstrate in different ways in different countries, but we need to speak in the public arena in such ways. We need to be active with politicians, sort of doing lobbying actions, and we need certainly the sort of top scientists to, to be our allies, because they are, we, some of us are top scientists, I'm not speaking for myself, and there, there is a science community, and we need their voice because they can be heard in a different way. Thank, Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Marta. Okay, so uh, I think we will keep uh, some of your questions for the debate part because we're running late and we have people on the line who've been waiting very patiently and we will start by bringing in to this discussion Amaya Moro-Martin, who is uh, linking up from the East Coast of the United States. She's an astrophysicist but she's also um, known uh, in, in Europe and in Spain in particular for science activism activities. Uh, so Amaya, uh, can we have Amaya on the, on the line? It should be, it, it did work this morning, so there's no reason why um, this can't work this afternoon. Are we? Okay. So this is where the music is supposed to play. Okay. And can we move on to uh, maybe? Ah, sorry. Oh, can you hear me? Good, oh, yeah. good. Lovely. Thank you. Can you hear me? Welcome, Amaya. It's good to see you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes we can hear you. There is a there is a delay of like. Yeah, you can hear me. 
Yes, go ahead. There is a delay of about um, 30 seconds. So this is why I was not responding because I could not hear the audio. But uh, I was afraid that you were referring to me because you were looking at the screen. So um, shall I start? OK, so I'm going, I think this is going to be a bit of a monologue. In, uh, OK. <laughs> okay, so I cannot hear, I cannot use the headphones because then I will hear myself with a delay of 30 seconds. So I'm just going to um, tell you uh, without listening to you, later I will put the headphones, but now I cannot, I just cannot speak and hear myself 30 seconds later. So I will just tell you you um, uh, what open science for an open world uh, brings to mind uh, for me. Um, um, first and foremost, it brings to mind the need uh, to share the benefits of the scientific process with the people that cannot afford to pay for it. Otherwise, it will never be open. Science will never be open. And this is related to the concept of shared prosperity that combines economic growth with equality. Uh, similarly, uh, um, enhancing and accelerating the scientific process can uh, contribute to an open world, but from my point of view, only if the people suffering from economic hardship can benefit significantly from these activities. In other words, if these activities can contribute to decrease the welfare gap. And open science has tremendous potential on this front because it can address not only challenges related to food insecurity and climate change that disproportionately threaten these communities, but can also contribute to improve their education, including, of course, STEM disciplines and their access to quality healthcare, electricity, water, and other vital infrastructure. Another concept that comes to mind when I think about open science for an open world is that of the need to place evidence-based critical thinking at the center stage uh, in society. And this is really the core of, scientific, of the scientific method. And I see this is uh, intimately related to the previous idea because there is nothing better, I think, to fight against the regimes that are partially responsible for the welfare gap I was referring to before than evidence-based critical thinking because, because it can provide citizens with the tools to speak truth to power. And I am talking, of course, about fundamentalist and authoritarian uh, regimes, but also about the fight against the uncontrolled greed fostered by our own democracies that for centuries have exploited the resources of impoverished communities around the world for the benefit of a few. Uh, we live in an area of post-truth um, politics, and uh, this new populism that is putting into question authority is also putting into question science when it speaks a language that runs counter to the ideology of those in power, or that could lead, for example, to regulation that partially control the grid that feeds this power. Uh, we are seeing this every day at this side of the Atlantic where I now live. Ideological assertions are made equivalent to science-based evidence. And a very significant fraction of the population is buying it, in part because we, are, we have been condescending, because as scientists we have offered them this body of knowledge, making them perceive it was unquestionable. Instead, we should have made them experts in the process of science, because science is a way of thinking, a way to search for the truth. And in this country where I live now, in the US, policymakers are taking advantage of that, using the argument that the days of trust me science are over. They are proposing policy to replace scientific expertise in critical institutions like the Environmental Protection Agency by representative of special interest groups with the goal of fitting regulations that were implemented as a result of scientific studies that show the negative impact of uh, some of the industry's activities on the environment and on human health. And only if citizens fully embrace evidence-based critical thinking, they will be able to stop this. They will be able to recognize that ideological assertions and evidence-based um, and, and science-based evidence are not interchangeable. And but we should be aware that this current uh, delegitimization and attempt to silence science is not new. To me, it brings to mind the destruction of the Library of Alexandria, a symbol of the loss of public knowledge, an attempt to erase what was learned in the past and impede critical thinking in the future. And this destruction was not a one-time historical uh, event. 
um, but expanded many centuries and many offenders that had different agendas. Similarly, similarly the defense of evidence-based critical thinking, the defense of open science, will be a long battle because the expansionary economy we live in, that it is proportionally benefits a few, is blind to the problems it creates. And the need to silence those who provide and analyze the evidence will become more acute as the problems get worse. And this is why we need citizens to demand evidence-based policy. Um, another idea that open science for an open world uh, brings to mind is that of um, what I want to add is open science for an open world, but with an open mind. Science can satisfy our physical needs, but should also satisfy our souls. We have curious minds, and the drive to satisfy that curiosity is one of the core human traits. In my day job, I am an astrophysicist. The science advocacy is done at night. And my field of research is exclusively driven by curiosity, and there are unquestionably, unquestionably many spin-offs that can benefit society arising from astrophysics-related uh, technology. But we should not apologize for trying to understand our place in the universe, for trying to look for life in another planet, to answer whether or not we are alone. If we did not try to answer these questions, we would be turning our backs um, to the same trade that brought us here. We will be truncating our fascinating intellectual journey. But again, we should make sure to share this joy with others, engaging in outreach activities, but also increasing the appreciation of all science communicators. Rather than looking down on them because they do not publish in our high-impact journals, we should engage and foster their activities because their contribution is critical to the opening of science. And this also relates to the need to place evidence-based critical thinking at the center stage in society because the best way to do this is through the inspiration that new scientific discoveries can trigger. And the last point I would like to make is that as an astrophysicist, I know a lot about the plans to send people to the moon and to Mars. And while I understand and share the scientific motivation behind some of these projects, when I hear about the goal to eventually exploit the resources of these and other solar system objects, all I can think of is a quote that I read in a sign at the foot of a towering 2,000-year-old sequoia. It said, humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together, all things connect. This is a quote by Chief Seattle from the late 1800s. And I feel that in this dizzling pace of scientific progress that we want to accelerate even more, we are turning our backs on the web of life we belong to. And not only that, human pressure is threatening its mere existence. We are exhausting the resources of this planet and we, are, we want even more. We are dreaming about exploiting. Uh, the resources of other planets, open science for an open world, but foremost, open science for a living world, our world. And this relates to all the other ideas I have mentioned because they are all about finding a balance among freedom, widespread welfare, our drive to satisfy our curious mind while sharing the joy with others, and the need to do all this in a way that does not threaten the web of life, in a way that respects our companion species in this planet. And science is critical to find that balance. So this is what, uh, to me, open science for an open world uh, means. Thank you much, Amaya. Uh, so we, we, we will keep you on the line for the debate. I know there is a, a delay. Um, but you may be able to listen to it live on YouTube directly. And I'd like to move on to our next guest uh, in, uh, uh, wor um, working remotely, Gary McDowell, uh, for Future of Research, also based in the US. Um, Gary, could you tell us a bit more about your organization and then um, give us your view on how uh, research um, and science should change? Uh, Sure. Um, so um, it's a great honour to be speaking to you all. Uh, as you might be able to tell, I'm also a proud European. I'm from Northern Ireland. Um, and I, um, I'm running a non-profit organisation that is promoting grassroots advocacy um, for foreign amongst junior scientists, um, early career researchers, um, primarily in the US, uh, also a little bit in Canada. Um, and, you know, one of the things we're uh, trying to promote is greater transparency about academia itself um, and are actually actively researching um, data about academia and what the academic system looks like and publishing that all openly and making the data open to try and help junior researchers navigate their way through the academic system. Um, and particularly in trying to find the way that they want to do science, whether that be in academia or not. Um, 
especially as focusing on biomedicine as we do tend to, uh, most people will end up outside academia. Um, we're also advocating for changes and reforms based on the problems that early career researchers are identifying when we hold local meetings and try and engage uh, uh, and directly find out what the problems are. And one of those problems is practicing open science. Um, and this was brought up earlier, the um, the fear that there is in practicing open science. And this seems even more acute in the junior scientific community who tend to have less agency overall uh, in the scientific uh, enterprise. So we are working with various groups. And again, Spark was mentioned before, the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition based in DC. Um, and we're trying to figure out ways of helping people practice open science and also try to change the incentive structure uh, in academia to make it um, a more accepted uh, way of doing science too. Um, and generally talking about this, the sort of open world of science too, we are very much keen to promote the idea that leaving academia is not leaving science and it's amazing how often those things are equated uh, and how often people ask me actually what it's like to have left science um, which is obviously ridiculous because scientists are not just restricted to academia and are not just even restricted to um, people who are not citizens um, so we're really trying to promote the idea of a wider community of scientists and citizens um, for science and um, you know, I have some experience working in a space in San Francisco here called Many Labs, which is trying to um, promote this and bring people from the community into a space where they can practice science, particularly related to climate change, and promote science for good. Um, and also with the March for Science, um, I'm actually speaking in a panel later this afternoon in San Jose um, with some of the national co-chairs from the March for Science, and they really... Um, I think are catalyzing some of what we hope to see of a wider community of scientists and citizens uh, engaged in science, um, which I think is something we truly desperately need now to have scientists and particularly from beyond academia engaging with all kinds of scientists. Um, that's what's necessary to bring a, you know, a diverse perspective to uh, the changes that we're needing um, in, in our community. Sorry. Um so uh, I, I, I would ask the audience and the panelists to keep their question for the end because we really want to have a lively debate. And we will move on to our next guest, uh, Pandelis Pirakakis, who's uh, based in Greece and in Spain. And he will um, introduce himself and tell us about his version of how he sees uh, research on science uh, becoming more open. I don't know if I'm. Yes. Can you can you it's hear working. me? It's now? Turn. Let's let's. Um, do yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. I don't know if it was something from my side. Anyway. So yeah, I think I was saying thank you for this kind of invitation. It's a, it's really an honor to be among you, uh, from from afar, from Spain right now. So I am. Um, Yes, discussing about open science, then um, clear that first we have to define the problem. So I agree, totally agree about uh, that a good definition can uh, show the way. So um, open science is obviously a solution to a problem. So what is the problem? The problem is, um, in my understanding, it's that um, at the core of school, of research validation, evaluation, communication at the moment is not the scientist, it's not science itself, it's not humanity, it's not society, but it's a journal. Uh, journals have, in the, in the last decades, have uh, accumulated excessive power. They control validation through peer review, they control evaluation of individual scientists, uh, universities, or even entire countries through citation. Uh, indices, which are very bad uh, indicators of quality. And of course, they also control uh, dissemination uh, with, uh, uh, with publication uh, requiring uh, fees for publication costs, either from the readers or from, uh, the, from the authors in the open access model, business model. So the problem is um, at the root of, of, of what open science is trying to fix, I believe is the, the concept, the very concept of the journal. The journal as a private enterprise who has a clear interest in maximizing uh, a benefit, be it uh, a monetary benefit or even uh, a prestige or a measured in impact. And the, the real issue is that this, um, 
maximizing this the journal benefit is in ma most of the cases it totally contradictory to the principles of science the principles of science that uh, requires uh, honest and open collaboration among scientists it requires uh, an attitude of, of uh, what i call open minded skepticism which is trying to figure out which is the most the best model to describe our data without thinking how to please uh, reviewers and and uh, journal editors so I, I do believe that uh, whatever we try to do to fix the system, if we do not, if we're not ready to abandon the idea of the journal, do it ourselves, uh, do the organize our activities as researchers around public infrastructure, around infrastructure that is not uh, dependent on commercial interests, like like now, like most journals now. If we, uh, when whenever we are ready to do that. But uh, around, as I say, public infrastructure, we can use institutional repositories, you can use those that are community governed, and we can offer the same services that we do now for journals, for example, peer review, and, um, and all other uh, real services that we're, that we're in need. Uh, then, unless we're ready to do that, then we will be still uh, treating symptoms without having the, um, the courage to, to confront the real uh, root problem. Um, so my my group, the group that I represent, Open Scholar, is exactly trying to uh, work in this area to uh, to develop and also promote alternative infrastructure, publicly governed, uh, community governed infrastructure that facilitates uh, review, facilitates basically review, but also other services related to other stages of the research research cycle uh, that are totally independent with uh, with the journal as we know it now. We have specific examples. We have uh, the platform we call Self Journals of Science, where uh, that works as any other repository preprint server, with the difference that it already offers uh, peer review services, uh, meaning that any interested researcher or group of researchers can uh, organize peer review activities uh, around this uh, this open and free uh, free platform. And we're also, we're also working with the uh, COAR, the Confederation of Open Access Repositories, so that we upgrade uh, infra existing uh, institutional repositories so that they can, in the near future they can play a more central role in scholarly communication than the one uh, that they mostly, for what they're mostly used now, as uh, mere archives of already published research. Um, so this, um, this is more or less the ideas that we'd like to bring to the table. And I'm, of course, available for the final debate. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to our last um, panelist and then take part to the debate. Sorry. Well, I am quite sure that I am the eldest panelist in opposition to what has been said, I would like to say that I am involved in that because I think that elder scientists have to be involved in a movement for changing many things in the scientific domain. The first, the first thing that I have to say is that I have been involved in science policy since long time because I try to be a responsible citizen. Because I have always believed that science and technology, as has been said, and I agree totally with the statements of Amaya in the last one, that uh, science policy for me is in a strategic need movement that needs now the help of the open idea because science policy is being corrupted. I don't know if you can analyze the quality of the persons that are taking the responsibility in the European Commission. That began with a person like Etienne Davignon. Now, now we have a person that is coming from Goldman Sachs as commissioner. The same thing has occurred with the general directors. It was a moment where 
big scientists, big directors of important firms like Nokia were the general directors, now the things are becoming worse and worse. Science policy has to be revisited, relaunched, rescinded. Second, for me, this, there is a need in the open idea, open science idea in an open world, reclaims also a very important effort in incorporating ethical issues in science policy and all discussions about science. Ethical seems to need to be now a very important issue for all of us. And last, I would reclaim the need for culturalizing, educating our societies. And that reclaims a new thing, not only the programs that are being launched, try to disseminate to the people the science, but trying to understand how research on scientific culture can be fostered, developed in order to understand how we have to communicate, to disseminate science to the people. Also, scientific culture needs, and that is my last statement. But I will have to leave because first I am not hearing anything. I could not intervene in the debate and also the delay is just creating me problems in my agenda. Slight technical problems, we don't hear Emilio anymore. So I think it's probably time for transitioning onto the debate. And before that, I would like to invite Baron Mons, who's arrived uh, recently to join us on the stage, to give us a um, five minute presentation on his take. And I think some of what he is saying will very much complement some of the discussion that were uh, held earlier, particularly concerning the need to share and to recognize the value of sharing data. So, uh, Barent, if you, uh, welcome to, to join us. Hello. Hello. Uh, do you want me to put this on your machine? Um, <coughs> on so this one. Yeah. On this one, yeah, yeah it's well, better. I'll use a few slides because I had no idea that I had five minutes or half an hour or whatever. <laughs> because I had to be close to Barcelona tonight. But I will so try to do it in five minutes. Yes, please, because we need time to, to discuss these things. Uh, is that the one? Yeah. So, <coughs> let me quickly uh, give you an overview. First, introduce myself in a second. I am Baren Mons, professor in Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands. But last year, I chaired the high-level expert group for the European Commission uh, on the European Open Science Cloud. Now, I got the feeling, listening to others, that makes me the enemy because I worked for these terrible bureaucrats and so on. But I hope to uh, convince you that's not true. So we made the report. You can read it. I won't go into it. Um, I don't know how <laughs> this now. The technology is really uh, giving troubles, or is it? How do I go to the next slide here? I can also try to do it without. Because time is of the essence now, I understood. You're all uh, late. So le let's, you know, let's do this yeah, without slides. I, ca I can do it without slides. So um, <coughs> I would say that open science, as I see it, is a lot more than just making things open. Um, and a lot more than just citizen science, which is a very important part of it. So the real issue here is, I think that open science is needed not only for all the reasons we have heard before, but also because the data sets that we deal with are simply too large now, not only in the life sciences, my field, but also in the humanities and everywhere, so that machines become very important in science. Data-driven science is done for a large part by workflows and virtual machines that are our major assistants now. So we m the point we made also in the report is we have to make data fair, that's different from open. So findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable for machines and people. That means that a lot of things have to change. We heard about the journals and the terrible journal impact factor that has to be killed immediately, we all agree. But also 
there's a number of major issues that have to change. A, we need data scientists and computer scientists to assist the domain specialists, and it's not easy to bridge that gap in many ways. Secondly, we have to change the opinion of what I call the silverbacks, and I'm begin becoming one myself, but that's the people that say impact factor and age factor, age factor I always say instead of age factor, and you know, we judge you on the stupid journals. No, we need a GitHub for science where everything is, uh, is uh, published, the data sets and so on. So we started after the, the report was out, we started an implementation mechanism, which is now very much supported by the secretaries of state in Germany and the Netherlands, but many other countries uh, are joining uh, soon, uh, which is called GoFair, Global Open Fair. So this goes beyond the European Union and the European Commission. There's many other uh, continents that are interested. And we start implementation networks of open science and fair data. And we have essentially defined three pillars. Go change, I'll come back to that and then finalize. Go build, that is really building the internet of fair data and services to enable open science technically, but I won't talk about that here today. And go train. So one of our recommendations was we need to train 500,000 data stewards in Europe, which is a missing profession. Those are the people that bridge the gap between data scientists and domain scientists. Uh, but Go Change, we have defined in our report as the most difficult part. We thought that 80% of the hurdles that were defined by the stakeholder community that we analyzed for a year all over the place were socio-technical or socio-cultural, not technical. We know how to do this technically. And this group, as I happened to discuss with Sabine at some other meeting where we met, might be the right group to start a Go Change implementation network to structurally change the scientific culture, which is going to be the most <coughs> difficult part of the open science cloud and everything, because if we do all kinds of beautiful things, but our deans and our, you know, the, the, the people that judge us will still judge us on nature papers, it will never change. So you have to make a bottom up scientific community-driven change and tell the silverbacks, like me, to change completely their way of awarding science and rewarding scientific contribution. And uh, so my plea would be, and we can discuss it in the debate, that you form this group, make it an official GoFair implementation network and say our implementation goal is change the scientific culture at its roots. Because otherwise all the other things are useless because it will not change anything. So that will be my very short pitch without slides. But, uh, I think it, it really is uh, much more effective this way because okay. you, you encapsulate really what's missing from the equation, the fact that there is a new profession on the horizon, data stewardship uh, related uh, jobs. And I, I think that the awareness in the community is so low that it's, it's really time that we start moving and shaking. Now we've had um, uh, quite a few preliminary discussion and um, discussions also with some of the panelists who are working remotely. Uh, some of them have underlined the need to do a lot of uh, opening of data, more sharing of data. This has been a constant leitmotiv in this discussion today. And um, preliminary um, survey of our um, activist group um, has shown that there is uh, quite a bit of support for this concept of um, open fair, go, going fair, going for fair, pro fair um, principle. And maybe if you want, uh, Sarah, to, to step in on, on that topic, uh, yeah. that would be very helpful. <laughs> May I say one thing before you do yeah. that? Because you sort of almost interchangeably used fair versus open. Uh, and I would like to really emphasize that fair of course, the default is open if you mm -hmm. take money from the European Commission, for example, you now your default is open. If you don't want to make your data open, you have to have a very good story. But the A in FAIR stands for accessible under well-defined conditions. So we allow that people shield their data, for example, because they're patient data. Mm -hmm. Or I was just discussing with the Africans this morning in, in Leiden, they don't want to make their data open because mm -hmm. they said first you stole our natural resources, then you stole our people, and now you steal our data. So they want to control their own data. Default, if you accept public money to generate the data, is open. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> but for example, the pharma is making their data fair. They pay for it themselves. The, da the A is zero. You can only access them if you are in the company. But their data suddenly talk to all open data, which is a big asset for them. So please don't uh, interchange open with fair. Most fair data will be open, but not all of them. That's a fair point. So uh, concerning the, the fact that we want, uh, you're very interested in grassroots communities across Europe to adopt the fair principle in their day-to-day -day job. We've, we've had preliminary discussion behind the scene in preparation of this meeting, and I think uh, the MCAA has had some, given it some thought, and maybe you want to share that with us, Sarah. Well, our preliminary uh, idea is that, yes, we are interested in, in interested in, in uh, participating in, and we are in favor of the go fair. But we, I mean, this is, I think, I, when you were talking, I mean, I still have many questions. I mean, there are many questions, and I, I have an issue of implementation of these within the institutions. And so I would like you to, if you could, how, how do you make that happen yeah. uh, within institutions with institutional support? OK, I, I am jumping a little bit ahead on whether the, the German and the Dutch government actually come out with the paper very soon. But uh, the principle that you've laid out there is this is a very open bottom-up initiative from the member states. Maybe we will ever ask money from the Commission, but that's not even the mm -hmm. goal. And we said it should be global and open, which means we have said anyone can start, in principle, a so-called GoFair implementation network. And it couldn't be in Go Build, Go Train, and Go Change. We don't have one in Go Change yet. We have Go Train, we have several in Go Build, building up already. The Dutch will start a support office. I'll be part of that, and we can help people to get on the road. So if you have more questions, we can actually help you. And the only thing you actually sign if you want to start a implementation network is the so-called rules of engagement. This is only one page, and it has been stripped down so far that, don't laugh, even Elsevier is prepared to sign for it. <laughs> so th they're really light. Did they say that on paper? No, yeah, 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 I have that on paper. So, um, but there is one criterion that I always put forward, like yesterday night, all the natural history museums, including Berlin and, you know, Naturalis in Leiden, want to start and, and make the metadata of all their specimens fair, so that you can study across all these collections, very interesting, but they have the so-called critical mass, because that is how the original internet uh, developed, there were many standards. NSF said, we take TCP IP and domain names. We don't tell anyone else what to do, but we take TCP IP. And then everyone flocked to that, and that's how the internet boomed in the late 90s. So the director of NSFNet is actually part of this group, and he's very much in favor, George Strawn, 76 now. But we said, if you want to start a implementation network, and you want to have impact, and you want to achieve the fact that you don't tell anyone else what to do, but if anyone else wants to do exactly the same thing as your network, and they say, no, we want to do it differently or separate from you, they have something to explain. So now, if you have all the leading natural history museums together, obviously, if some other museums say, we don't want to use your ontology, we don't want to use it, they have something to explain. Now, go change is, of course, the most difficult part. And also, in this case, who is, there is no critical mass, hmm. by definition, to say, okay, we can now change, because why do we want to change? We are the minority, and the big silverbacks are sitting there, and they want to keep everything as it is. And they want to keep nature papers and so on going. Mm. So we need to find a way to use the, f the voice of younger scientists, the scientific community, to make very explicit that unless the reward system and the incentives in science change fundamentally, open science is not going to happen. That is absolutely true. <laughs> and how can we do that? I mean, I'm, I'm asking you the question as well. It's not like I have a recipe that and say, oh, tomorrow yeah. you have this implementation. But we need one. Yeah. And you could be it. OK, so I think we have questions from the floor on this particular issue of the reward system and changing it. Uh, Mike, do you, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, I, I think the mic is coming. <laughs> <laughs> And then we, we'll, uh, we'll open the, the discussion to our floor as well, to our remote uh, panelists uh, after Mike's question. 
Hi there. Um, I think in order to get cultural change going, what we really need is to embrace the new era of actually using all the data that's available. Uh, for a start, we need central data cartographers to actually get a grip in terms of what is out there. But if you think of all of the PhD students and postdocs that lead extremely precarious lives, going from one big grant to another big grant and having them fail, and then maybe dropping out of academia and going into industry with no connections with industry, you have a wealth of talent there of people who can be engaging in the next phase of science, which is actually data reuse, rather than primary science, data generation, actually data reuse. If something like the Commission were to have a huge chunk of money for short single-person contracts to just dive into data publicly available, preferably through some kind of Google for data provided by the Commission, because then you also get the feedback about how the system works, then you've got lots of young people that can exploit those data either for academic research, for new business generation, or for public citizen services. So this then becomes open to small businesses to use with you know, small grants, or citizens to use for public services. And that's also how you start breaking down the sort of like academia to business to citizens barriers as well. I really think that there is a huge potential in actually getting more people almost trained up by opportunity and force <laughs> um, to actually get on top of all the data that's coming out and start building that new world of data reuse. Yes, I think it's a, it's a very valid point, and let me answer with two observations. If we do a survey in our own institute where we have 800 PhD students at any given time, time the average time they report for data munching, trying to find the data that they want to reuse, etc., is 60% of their time. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. I mean, they, they spend all this time trying to find the data because there is not a Google for data, and there will mm -hmm. not be very soon. So we have said, okay, if our, all the metadata are fair, we have the search engine because it can just search the, the fair metadata, then people at least know the data are there and the machine knows whether it can use it or not. So in our report, we said to the commission, you need to start something like what we call the DARPA challenges, which is swearing in church because yeah. it's the American term. But you know, DARPA says we need a plane under the radar, build it. Here's the money. Yeah. Now, finally, although Muedas and so on had said hey, two billion here and all the big numbers go around, it is a struggle. It may succeed to get a hundred million in the working program. And before you know it, and that's again a cultural change, the funding mechanism precludes this because there is calls and then every member state has to pee over the call and then next year there is a call out and then you have 5% chance to get the money and you have 800 people submitting to the call. That's not a way to no. achieve this. So we said to the commission, if you want to achieve this, you need targeted strategic money yes. to fill in the white spots yeah. when one yeah. you just yeah. mentioned, we have 10 more. But then getting that into this totally rigid system is almost impossible. And there are some very good people in the commission that try up to the level of Robert John, but it is extremely difficult. And the member states, in a way, although fairly bureaucratic here and there as well, are much easier. If they get together, they spend 95% of the money anyway, because Horizon 2020, mind you, is only 5% of the trillion we spent on research in Europe. So we can spend 5% now of every research grant from the Commission, and I hope most national funders will follow, on data stewardship and those kind of things. Yeah. That is 50 billion right there. So yeah. there is money, yeah. but the member states have to move, not just the Commission. I thought of a way around some of the problems associated with trying to build this into something like Horizon 2020. And that is you have the structural funds which you can use a lot more directly. And also we have an urgent need at the moment to stimulate science in the peripheral regions. Also, um, particularly, well, if, in fact, if you look at all the peripheral regions, you have some people with real data competence in, in Greece, um, in Portugal, and certainly in Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. So it might be an interesting way to test out these kind of grant-given 
the, the, these, the, these quick data reuse grants through that mechanism before you would put it through the excellent system and jeopardize everything that the silverbacks care about there. But also you know that uh, in GoFair we have stimulated the countries that are having direct access to structural funds to use them for a GoFair implementation networks. And they can. But it's again a national decision how to use the money. Yeah. Okay, so I'd like to give an opportunity to our remote panelists to step in. I know uh, Gary McDool um, makes some comments about his view on opening data. Is, uh, do you want to comment on this, uh, Gary? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I first of all agree with the entirety with the idea that we need to change the incentives um, and what's being rewarded in academia. And it's something we're very curious about how to actually do this because, you know, people are only being rewarded for papers and grants right now. Um, and we think people should be getting rewarded for advocacy work, for teaching, for uh, science communication and all of these various things. It's incredibly important. And I think academia does itself a disservice by not doing it. Uh, and in terms of the um, data being out there, I mean, absolutely. We, same as in the US, Europe needs to be sort of analyzing its own system very clearly. Um, and um, Mike makes a really good point about that we have all these people who are, who were essentially chucking out of the system uh, and sort of forgetting about, and we could make use of all this talent um, for sure in doing this analysis. Okay, so Martha? I mean, there is, I mean how, does, how does political or cultural change occur, generally? There is one vision that there are very you know, important people who have a, a vision, uh, sort of the enlightened dictator who has a vision and then everything changes. Well, I, I don't really believe in that. I think that uh, change comes when there is a, a collective political will for, for change. And, and the thing is that scientists are generally not organized to, to make their will be clear. And if there is any kind of organization, it's really a sort of semi-top-down organization where the sort of powerful scientists, people who have been very successful, are allowed to have a word. And I don't think that this is how it's going to work. And even less at the European level, because at the European level, this, this level, this way of, of acting is, is even more disorganized than at the national level. So I really call you know, for sort of giving us the means of a collective organization of scientists, probably of a new kind, because I don't think that we're going to build a union or a political party or whatever. It doesn't make any kind of sense, obviously, or new organizations are sort of more agile and flexible than old organizations. I mean, old, it's, it's quite visible. Old organizations are declining everywhere. So we have to find ways of combining the advantage of all kinds of organizations, their stability, and new kinds of organizations, which are somewhat internet-based, uh, rely on a lot of volunteer work, uh, are sort of flexible, tend to appear and then disappear, but they are the ones which provide, you know, the, the, the momentum. Well, one of the things I would like to say is that uh, scientists are not very good communicators, as you say, usually also to the society, so they cannot make their point very well. But if there is one thing we're good at, it's generating data. And the other thing that we see is that if you have bureaucrats, and specifically scientists that became bureaucrats, like deans, they've never been trained as a bureaucrat, so they act out of fear, not out of opportunity. They want to keep everything safe, to leave at the same budget as when they entered, like in our hospital. So you have to scare them. And I think that what we can do in this implementation network that I have in mind, and I'm not saying it's you, but there, we need one, is like I just said, we can now demonstrate that 80% of the data that are generated with public funding disappears. It's a waste of money. You can tell them, you will be in jail because you're wasting my taxpayers' money. That's data. It's, it's dark data, as Phil Bourne calls it from NIH. 
80%. That's 28 billion loss in the Uni United States alone. We know that the average PhD student in data intensive science spends 60% of his time or her time on data munching. Those kind of data, if you can really show what is wrong with science today and how journals kill science at the moment, then, and how journals are a nightmare for computers anyway. <laughs> so we have data to convince people and expose the mistakes of the current system. That's, that's step one. And then when the bureaucrats are scared enough to become prone to change, then you say, look at the benefits of having all these data available. And here are the major breakthroughs already made via fair data, and, and they're coming. Nature is already sending out calls for papers for which you're not allowed to generate new data. You just reuse other people's data. So it's coming. But scaring the bureaucrats with facts is probably the only thing a bottom-up group can do. Find these facts, publish about it, show how terrible it is with fraud and you know all this kind of stuff. Uh, is there anyone from the remote line who wants to step in on that particular point? I mean, I will, if that's okay. We've we've actually done exactly that, and you're exactly right. Collecting data about what institutions are do doing or what various policies are and putting it out there actually affects, it's been one of the most effective ways of getting institutions to change. So they don't like being compared. They don't like, they know what the right answer is, and they don't like being shown that they're not following what the correct thing is to do. So I'm absolutely with you on that, getting the data on that and putting it out there publicly is very effective. Because I think, um, I mean, the usage of the data and generating the data and putting the data and sharing the data is one thing. But I think we are stuck already still in the first phase in many cases. I mean, we are not sharing the data yet. Okay? In global, I think we are starting, but we are not actually yet sharing data. And we have many, many institutions that are not on board. And so I would say that first we need maybe to educate and inform and to show people how this can change. And then we can we can do everything else too, but I think we at the moment I don't think um, I think we need to help out scientists a little bit. I mean people can share the data but they don't know how to use uh, say all the data management tools and and all that and I think that has to happen as well well let me say uh, I, I just uh, sent the manuscript of a data stewardship book to Taylor and Francis you know a book saying stop mm. writing books but mm. okay <laughs> and there is a uh, more than 120 questions that a good data steward should ask mm. uh, so it is a dream that a scientist that is going to be a top scientist in the domain is ever going to be a good data steward. It's a yeah. profession in itself. So that's exactly. why we have to train data stewards. But if you train one, they're taken away by Elsevier or a big company or Albert Heijn, mm. you know, even they see the value of big data. So it's such a crazy thing that the last uh, scientific segment that understands the value of big data is academia. Yes, All the exactly companies, the supermarkets, they deal with it on a daily basis, they make billions of it, and we don't even move. Why? I have no incentive to share my data. Precisely. Because I cannot publish more nature papers Precisely. on my biobank or whatever I have in my field. So again, it's not that scientists don't want to do it, some of them don't, but most are... They don't do it because they don't see the incentives. There is no incentives, no. actually they're punished for it, yeah. and I would also make a plea to quit the term data sharing. Hmm. In the internet of fair data and services, you don't send your data anywhere. You allow people to reuse your data on the spot. So you keep your data on your own server. You allow workflows to come visit the data, do deep distributed learning. That is a bit technical, but you know the workflows are infinitely lighter than the data. In my field, if you want to send your data somewhere else, there are terabytes. If I want to send the genome of the Netherlands to EBI in Hingston, and I would have to pay Amazon just for the download price, that's 60,000 euros. There's no way. Yes. And the data are private. So we need to exchange also in that data science type of things, 
distributed learning over data that never move. And I have not seen, and we made a challenge in the European Open Science Club, come with scientific questions that cannot be answered by distributed deep learning over distributed sessile data sets. Nobody came to me yet with a convincing story. So 90% of the questions can be answered without bringing the data in some stupid old-fashioned data warehouse centrally. You just visit them where they are in the Internet of Fair mm -hmm. Data and Services. That feels already as much more control on my data. Mm -hmm. I can at least record the reuse of my data by others. Mm -hmm. and they can, the data should be citable, so I can be rewarded. And there are entire working groups in Brussels to work on that now, on new reward systems, uh, metrics, on data sharing and so on. But as long as my dean says, who cares? Yes. I told him that our FAIR paper was tweeted like the, the, the best tweeted paper in, in nature ever. He said, are you on Twitter? Fired. Mm -hmm. As a joke. But I mean, that he doesn't care mm. on old metrics whatsoever. Yes. Um, just uh, following on, on this discussion. Go ahead. Uh, I, is it, did you just, just I, I, am, I, am I supposed to speak now? <laughs> okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, it's <laughs> so yeah, um, just very, very briefly, I hear a lot about people uh, trying to tell scientists how they should do science and how we, you know, but supposedly scientists are society's best problem solvers. And uh, if they have a problem, they're the most qualified to solve it. And actually they've solved all the, all the problems. I mean, if we're, <laughs> all the problems of science are solved at the moment. It's just a matter of looking who has solved it and how. So there are people who are doing amazing things things in data sharing, uh, uh, in software coding, in open open source software coding, and so all the solutions are there. There are platforms, there are, uh, there, is, uh, there are protocols, there are, uh, there are uh, initiatives, everything is out there. So the only thing that uh, probably uh, top-down uh, or technocrats should be doing is just to go and see who are the leading people in the new, uh, in the new vision that we want for science and just incentivize them because right now I may uh, publish an open source open source software that will be used by hundreds or thousands of researchers but if I don't publish the software in a high impact journal I don't receive any credit for it but you know the solution is there so this goes with everything this goes with data this goes with data sharing this goes with every single problem that a scientist has had to face in, in, in their workflow they've solved it and in the best possible way because that's what, what we're good at so it's not about it's not a point of telling us what to do it's a point of finding who of us are doing it in the best possible way based on some some vision and some principle and and reward these people i think it's as simple as that yeah, did you want to the last word Can you hear me? I cannot hear anything. Okay, you can hear me. Okay, I, I see the. Okay, I, I see someone doing this. So good. Um, I just wanted to make a quick point regarding uh, data. Um, we also need to make sure, and I don't think this has been mentioned, that the data obtained that is cover, um, uh, obtained with current experiments is sufficiently well documented to allow uh, usage decades from now. And this is not trivial, and this is not being done um, on a systematic manner, at least not in my field. Uh, and there is um, um, huge amounts of data that, uh, that are being gathered right now, and more is to come. And now the projects actually should put and are not putting a significant fraction of their operations um, into, into data, into big, si big, big data science. And this is not happening. So I think this is an aspect also to keep in mind. So it's not a question of collecting the data, but also documenting it 
and, and putting it in a format that in a format that you know 100 years from now decades from now even 100 years from now can, can still be used attending this debate uh, here today in Barcelona and to those of you who have uh, attended it remotely it's been quite a stimulating uh, day with a lot of discussion a lot more work has to be done but at least we have uh, some kind of sense that among the community of grassroots scientists there is a, a, a real will to to join forces because uh, those groups are already used to working collaboratively and to listen to their communities and I think uh, next time we organize this uh, sort of meeting there will be a lot more progress made concerning how we will work together. There are concrete solutions on the table. Um, the go fair principles are something that um, any scientist individually can uh, choose to adopt and, uh, and in order to help implementation um, it is clear that we can um, um, join forces with some of the grassroots groups who are already prepared to adopt those principles. So it's, it's a matter of time uh, before we ha we're self-organized uh, a bit more towards uh, that goal. And of course there's a lot more to open science and opening research than sharing data, but it's just a very concrete example of what can be done, done easily for now. Thank you to all of you and um, um, see you back on uh, euroscientist.com uh, in the coming weeks. Bye-bye.